Hey there, Grove men. It is good to be back with you. I believe we're in week seven this week. Um, I'm actually coming to you live from Ecuador, right? We've got our golf classic coming up in November, November 12th to be specific, right? And if you want to play golf, you love to play golf, register online. But when you register online, if you're thinking about even being a sponsor, there's an opportunity there for you as well. See, so I'm here in Ecuador looking at projects that we're going to be doing when we come at the beginning of next year. The funds that we raise in that golf classic, it's going to help take care of some of these projects that we're working on. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of stuff that we're doing down here that is exciting. We want you to be a part of that and partner with us. Won't you do that? Hey, today uh, we're going to be listening to John Marcellus. He's jumping into Galatians chapter 2 again, verses 15 to 17. Um, excited to hear what he has to say. Pray that you guys are well. You're enjoying your journey through Galatians. And it's so great to be with you. Let's see what John has to say. Okay, let's begin the exam. You'll have to let me know if you can see these words clearly. How does this look for you? Blurry and out of focus. Hmm. How about this one? Still out of focus. Well, perhaps this is what you need. Hello, Grove men. It's an absolute honor to be with you today as we dig in more into Galatians. And I owe a debt of gratitude once again to Trevor. He keeps giving me the best of the best. And I don't know of any, more, any better uh, verses than what he's given for us to talk to today. We're talking in Galatians, picking up. My name is John Marcellus. I'm a lay pastor here. And we're going to be looking at justified by faith. Galatians 2, 15 to 17. I hope that you've gotten your workbooks out because they have excellent questions in them. And so when I looked at the questions that you've been given, I said these are a great outline and a great hitting of the major topics that are actually in this part of God's Word. So let's look at these. How would you explain justification by faith to someone who has never been to church before? Number two, what role do faith and works have in our justification? Three, what does it mean to be justified before God? Four, what is justification in Christ so important? And the last, what is the difference between justification by faith and justification by works. So my goal by the end of this for you today is for you to have a good grasp on this and a good understanding of the depth of God's Word as you go into this very important subject. Galatians 2, 15 to 17. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law through faith in Je but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. This goes through several different areas. If we look at it, we can divide it up into three areas to take a look at this, this verse. Um, Salvation is only through faith in Christ. Period, dot, there's nothing to add. Because if we add anything to what Jesus did, then he wasn't perfect. He wasn't able to meet what we needed to. So that danger is really addressed here. That it can be only justification by faith. He looks at first here, he talks about us generally. He goes to person, when we look at that, know that a person is not justified by our works. We're looking at... A general thing to all people. So generally to all people, this is true. When you go further into it, you see then that person we say we. All of a sudden, Paul is addressing us as we. So we also have believed in Christ. Who is this we? These are all of us who are um, with Paul and with all of us today. We who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he does it universally at the end. He looks at it that no one is justified. Here. So now he goes to that law that no one will be justified. So we see here that Paul is talking to generally to everyone. He's also talking personally in the we. It's each one of us in our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then universally as it looked at as it applies to everyone else. We is used in, this, in these verses four times. Who is that we? Well, it's Paul, it's Peter, and all the other Jewish Christians. Those who had lived under the system of law as a way of life. This is, a trans, this is a time of change for the Christian church. 
In fact, the Christian church is just being born. So we're going from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And you have to keep that in mind as you look at these verses. Because Paul's trying to take us across that change of the New Covenant. There's no difference and everything in the Old Testament absolutely is true. But now as we talked before, circumcision, um, doing the sacrifice of animals, those things are no longer required because Jesus brought in a new covenant. He fulfilled all those areas. And now Paul is addressing that, bringing, bringing it beautifully together for both Jews and Gentiles. There is one gospel, and that's what he's showing us very clearly here. Gentiles, in this is kind of referred to as sinners, all right? So it's not um, publicly immor immorality in a behavioral sense. It's more a legal sense. It's saying you are legally a sinner, and that is where we are. And we're going to see that justify, for me, a way is this, just as if you have not. So we're going to have justification because we all are sinners, but then God is making just as if we had not sinned. And so that's what justification is doing. And that justification is changing our position for eternity. Justification, what does it mean? It means we're declared righteous. When a jury foreman reads a verdict, and then that jury foreman and that person is either declared guilty or they're declared innocent. If you're found guilty, then you're going to go on and you're going to have to pay. And, but if you're found not guilty, then you walk out of that court a free person in the eyes of the law. And that is what God is doing. He's allowing us to walk out of that courtroom where we are guilty. But he, because of what he did and through our faith in him, he declares us not guilty. If that's going to put shivers down your spine, I don't know what will. But we are walking before God in the court room of the Lord, and we are guilty. But Jesus himself says, you're not guilty. And that's the beauty of it. And how do we get there? By faith, not by works. By faith in the Son of God. Hebrews talks about this faith. As we look at a couple other verses, I'd like to go over with you. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. So that's faith. That's the essence of faith. These are things that we hope for in conviction of things not seen. We can know that it's true because God is the one who promises it. When we look at Genesis 15, 6, we see this in the, very, in the Old Testament, the very beginning. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. Who is this? This is Abraham. Okay, this is the very beginning. Abraham had faith and God credited it to Abraham as righteousness. And that was the justification that he understood and that he had. And it's no different for us today. Because by faith, what did Abraham do? He obeyed. And when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he's going. God didn't tell Abraham, I'm going to take you here. He said, go, Abraham. And Abraham had to leave everything and go with all his possessions, all his cattle, and everything and take his family and go on a trip, but he knew that he could depend on God. And so that's the essence of this faith. This faith is that we know it's true and we're crazy. You're right, if the world looks at us, we are crazy, but we're not because we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We see further in faith in Hebrews 11, by faith he went to live in a land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he's looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. And that's the faith that we're talking about, the faith that Abraham had. And that's why he's our father of faith for both Jews and Gentiles, for all those who believe. We can look at this also as we look at the things that God is doing for us, okay? Biblically, we see about justification, and what it does is it brings us to an adoption. We're adopted as sons and daughters. We become fellow heirs with Christ. We're united with Christ, becoming one with him, and we are in Christ as he is in us when that faith occurs. And this justification, this word, what it does is it gives us Christ's righteousness, not a righteousness that we deserve, but a pure righteousness that he gives us. It changes our standing totally. We are from lost to found. We are from dead to living. Once and for all, 
we are now in a different camp at that moment. And it's also, it's an event. That justification is that event, that event in our life when we believe. Now, there's another word I just want to touch on for a second, that's sanctification. Sanctification is, just to complete this idea of justification, is sanctification has two aspects to it. It has the aspect of once and for all that we are then sanctified. Okay, we are glorified and we'll be with the Lord. But also it has this part that we all experience every day. Sanctification is that part that it's a daily walking with God. It's a daily sanctifying our life. It's a daily coming closer to Him. It's a daily God pointing out sin in our lives and helping us become more and more conformed to the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So God does not justify those He does not sanctify. And so we can put our hats on that one. In Philippians, Paul said, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing knowledge of worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. That what? That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection of the dead. And that is a blessed hope for us. James goes on, it's kind of a parallel in giving us this idea of works and faith and righteousness and justification. And James in two, chapter, 20, uh, chapter 2, verses 21 to 26, he goes, Was not Abraham our father justified by works? when he offered up his son on the altar. You see that faith was active along with the works, and faith was completed by his works. So there were works there, but the initial was the faith. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified, see a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. So in the same way was not Hal's Rahab, the prostitute, justified by works, when she received the messenger and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So our faith will have an outward manifestation of works. And praise God that he does that for us, because in that outward manifestation of works, that helps us know that, yeah, we belong to him. And when we see him working in and through us through the power of the Holy Spirit, that gives us an incredible joy in our lives. So there is this relationship of faith and works, and I want to be honest with you on that. But even in James, which is a lot about works, it says faith without works is dead. Okay? But the faith is the primary as we look at that. Let's look at some Romans. Romans says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God, what? Through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to receive what? By faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from, apart from works of the law. So the law can't save us, but the law points out our sin. But it's our faith that justifies us, our faith in Christ. And we see this very strong, and we see this in Romans, where once again, as Paul was saying to the whole world about this, that here we see it again, that all have sinned. So this goes to everyone and all, both the Jews and the Gentiles, and to all people as we go through. When we really look at this in Romans 5, it, it carries on a little bit more. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, what? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. God saves us through this justification, just as if we have not sinned. You are free to go. Whatever was brought against you in this courtroom is gone. You are free. And that is an amazing thing that what God does for us. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? No matter of law, a keeping can make a person righteous. 
Man's basic problem is not what he does, but who he is. Sinful acts are an outward expression of a depraved nature that contains sinful thoughts. So this tells us that Jesus brought this to us in the Sermon on the Mount, and he brought a whole new aspect to the law. The law could have been seen as an external thing, and there is, an, there is absolute parts of it that are external. As we see, as we break the law, if you break the law and you're taken to court, somebody's found you externally breaking the law. But we don't take people to court by like, ah, I think you were thinking about breaking the law. But God does. And Jesus did in the Sermon on the Mount. He brought it to a further depth. Just for those of you who think you're perfect and you've never been brought um, before a um, judge, let's look at what Jesus had to say. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. What is he saying here? It's in our heart. The law was to point out things that are not only outside, but are on the inside. And Jesus wants all of us. And even if we keep these things, we can sin inside of us that would keep us separated from God. So it's, it's a deep thought. Here's another one from Matthew 5. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So men, it's not just what we're looking at. It's not just what we do. It's what we think. And God is calling us to a higher level there. He's calling us to that. You know, Martin Luther this was a centerpiece for him. He said, For if the truth of being justified by Christ alone, not by works, is lost, then all Christian truths are lost. For there is no middle ground between Christian righteousness and work righteousness. There is no middle ground. There's none when we look at that. So no matter what level of law keeping that makes a person righteous, man's basic problem is not what he does but it's who we are. Those sinful acts are an outward expression of a depraved nature that contains sinful thoughts. So this is the crux of it. This is the most important part of it. This is what he's really getting to here when Paul bring, gives us these verses, that he's talking about both the Jews and Gentiles, to everyone. He's addressing the whole world. He's addressing us in a personal way, and he's addressing those who are also believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So he covers everything in these verses. But this is a key verse for our faith because we are justified by faith, not by works. Men, if we add anything to the gospel, anything that's part of us, then we are telling the King of Kings and Lord of Lords that what he did on the cross wasn't enough, that somehow he needed us to do something. That, that it wasn't complete, that his sacrifice wasn't enough, that God needed us on his team, that God needed us to do something, to, to fully do this, other than faith. But he does call us, to, call us to have faith. And that's the faith that we saw in Abraham. That's the faith that we saw in Rahab, as we read today. That's that faith that steps out, going where God would tell us to do, go, and doing what God would tell us to do, with maybe not the whole picture. But it's enough, and he's giving us enough. I'd like to close with just one other area today, and this is an area that was really important to me as a Gentile when I got to go um, visit Israel. And it was this idea of Peter's vision. It says in Acts 10, the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. And he saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. We see a lot of threes in Peter's life, don't we? We see the three times that he denied Christ, 
We see that the three times that Jesus said, brought him back and reinstated him and telling him to, to love and take care of the sheep. And we see another three here. We see that God had to tell Peter three times. And what, why is this so near and dear? Why is this so dear to me? Because this is me. I'm those ugly animals on that sheep. I was that part of the Old Testament that, no, we can't, you, you, you can't, we, I, I can't be clean. I can't be righteous. But God said, no, no, Peter. What God has made clean, do not call common. And what he's saying is he's saying, Peter, this is not only for the Jews. This is for the Gentiles, as it always was. And, and God gives Peter a new purpose and a new way to look forward. And so I am just thrilled with that. There are Gentiles in the Old Testament that are saved all over the Old Testament. It's very clear in the Old Testament. But God had to grab Peter, wrestle him down, cage up his mind, and say, hey, you're missing this. You're missing this. It's for everybody. So thank you for your time today. It's been great to bring you God's word. Just remember, we are justified by faith. And may you find just a great hope in that as you look forward to what that day will be when God brings you home to him. And may we know that when we stand before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, we're going to stand before a judge and we're going to be guilty. But then he's going to step down. He's going to give us his righteousness and declare us not guilty. Praise the Lord.